let us discuss the uh, risk representation theorem, uh, which states that a Hilbert space is uh, isometrically isomorphic to its dual space. And uh, for our formulation, we concentrate on real Hilbert spaces. That is, uh, Hilbert spaces that are over, uh, defined over the field of real numbers. Of course, this theorem is also valid in the complex case. But uh, for simplicity of the proof, uh, we consider uh, real Hilbert spaces. So from now on, if uh, we say a Hilbert space, we mean a Hilbert space over the uh, field of real numbers. Okay, so let X be a, uh, a real Hilbert space. Uh, the map J from X into its dual uh, defined uh, as follows. So J of X. So this must be an element of the dual space. So it is a function from uh, X into R. Okay. So the value is just the inner product of X and Y for all Y in the domain. Then uh, this map is uh, an isometric uh, isomorphism. So let us look uh, at the proof. And we do this, uh, let's say in several steps. Step one, uh, let us show that J first is well-defined. That is, uh, J of X is linear and bounded uh, for any uh, X in capital X. So first, uh, J of X is linear since uh, the inner product uh, is linear with respect to the first argument. Okay, so here if you put uh, a Y, you apply uh, the linearity of the inner product with respect to the first argument, you get the linearity of J of X. For uh, any Y in X by the uh, cauchy swatch inequality, you get the following estimate. So this is the definition okay, of J of X of Y. And this is less than or equal to the norm of uh, Y times the norm of X. Thus, according to the definition of uh, the uh, norm in X prime, this implies that uh, J of X is in the dual space of X. And in fact, we can estimate the dual norm. So what we do is, uh, this is a specific upper bound. And since the dual norm is the least upper bound, uh, I should say this one, okay? Since the argument here is Y. So this is less than or equal to the norm of X. So this implies that uh, J of X is indeed bounded. So that's uh, the first step. The second one is to show that J is an isometry. Hence, it is injective 
because uh, we already know that uh, an isometry is necessarily one-to-one. -one. To prove uh, that it is an isometry, okay, we need uh, to show that here uh, equality is attained. So let's start with uh, an element of your Hilbert space that is not a zero. Then uh, if we, uh, let's say, normalize this, so J of X evaluated the normalized uh, vector. So by definition, this is the inner product of the argument with x. And uh, in this case, uh -huh. of course, let's take the or we, we can apply the linearity and recognize that this is what. Um, take note that the uh, inner product of the vector with itself is the norm squared. And uh, this is the norm of x squared. Okay, so we can also take the uh, absolute value and get the same result. We should have only a power one here. So therefore, we have uh, the following. So the operator norm or the dual norm, recall, that is the supremum of j uh, of x of y, as long as the norm of y uh, is less than or equal to one. We take a specific uh, y, so we take y to be the norm, uh, the normalized uh, vector corresponding to x. So this uh, supremum must be larger than this. And uh, we know that this is equal to the norm of x. Hence, the dual norm of j of x is equal to the norm of x. For any x in capital X, why is that? Uh, because of uh, the first step, we have the uh, reverse inequality. Here, I uh, take note that uh, this argument is, uh, was provided uh, in the case where x is not equal to zero. However, this uh, equality is valid uh, even in the case when uh, x is zero. Because uh, j is linear, therefore j of uh, x must be zero and both sides will be then equal to zero. Okay, so you can include uh, the vector uh, zero for this equality. So this proves that uh, J is indeed uh, an isometry. So it is a norm preserving map. Okay, now to Consider the final step, so step three. Let us show that J is surjective. So 
So for this, let us take an x prime. Okay, so if x prime is zero, then uh, we know that, of course, uh, by definition, uh, j of x, or say for all y in x, uh, x prime of uh, y is equal to uh, zero. And take note that this is equal to the norm of y and x by taking a specific value of x, and that would be the zero vector. And this is the same as j of zero of y. Thus, uh, this implies that uh, x prime, since this is true for any y in x, x prime, which is equal to zero, the zero vector in the dual space, is equal to j of zero. Okay, so if uh, you have a zero uh, bounded linear functional, that is an element of the dual space, uh, the inverse image uh, is equal to zero. So this is the uh, trivial case. Now let us suppose that uh, x prime is not equal to zero. Then if it, if, it, uh, if x prime is not a zero uh, functional, there exists uh, an element, let's say z, that is not equal to zero such that the image of z under the linear functional x prime is not also equal to zero. So if your a linear functional x prime is non-zero, it must be non-zero at a certain point. And we are guaranteed that this uh, uh, inverse image uh, z is not also equal to zero because if z is zero, then uh, you get a contradiction because the left hand side would be zero as well due to linearity of x prime. For uh, simplicity, let us denote by n uh, the null space or the uh, kernel of x prime. So this is the set of all x such that x prime of x is equal to zero. And uh, we normalize uh, z, uh, so define that to be a vector e. So let's say this is uh, z divided by uh, x prime of z. With this, you can now uh, apply the linearity okay, of uh, x prime. This is uh, equal to one. Okay, so you can uh, pull out the denominator here. Or more precisely, the reciprocal of that uh, x prime of z. Likewise, we define x naught to be uh, e minus the projection of e. So here, p sub n is the uh, projection, in fact, the orthogonal projection of x onto the kernel n. And we know that uh, the difference must be in the orthogonal uh, complement of n. Uh, in other words, uh, x naught of n is equal to zero for all n in the uh, kernel. So for each n in the kernel, if we take the inner product of x naught
or I should say uh, for each y in x, we can uh, compute the following. Uh, we can write y as y minus uh, x prime or I should say we compute uh, the, uh, the value of x prime of y minus x prime y x naught okay by linearity this is x prime of y minus uh, x prime of y x prime of x naught however x prime of x naught according to the definition of x naught is e minus pn of e and uh, this is x prime of e minus x prime of pn of e this is equal to one according to this okay since the projection is is, is in a, uh, is in n that's the kernel of x prime this is zero so therefore this is equal to one so we now know that uh, this one equal to one so if that is equal to one so this is a zero okay so with this uh, we can write okay we can write uh, x prime of y so we will write this as follows. So add and subtract this term. And then by uh, linearity, plus, okay, so this is uh, what? Uh, X prime x prime of y x naught we know that uh, this first term which we calculated here is zero and uh, this yields okay uh, Uh -huh. This is not what we need. So I apologize for that. Instead, uh, we look at uh, the fact that we look at the inner product of y and uh, x naught. Okay. This is equal to y x prime y naught x naught plus uh, x prime y naught so there is a missing x naught here so we add uh, and subtract this term basically So from here, uh, the value of x prime is in, uh, this one is in n, because uh, x prime is, uh, of that, uh, of this vector is zero, so therefore the argument must be uh, in the kernel. So this one is in n, and x naught, uh, recall, is in the orthogonal complement. So the first term, is equal to a zero.
Okay, so we can now only concentrate on the second term. And for this, you can factor uh, the scalar x prime y naught, and you end up with the inner product of x naught with itself. So that's basically the squared norm. And uh, of course, there should be no subscript of y. And therefore, we now uh, we can now divide, okay, and apply the uh, linearity with respect to the second argument of uh, the inner product. Okay, so this is basically according to the definition, j of x naught divided by the norm squared evaluated at y. And this is true for any y in capital X. Oops, or uh, in other words, uh, that is uh, x prime is equal to j of x naught divided by the norm squared. So we uh, found uh, uh, the corresponding inverse image. This implies that uh, the map J is surjective. So that's uh, there is a representation theorem. So stating in a different way, so given X prime in the dual space of the Hilbert space, okay, there exists a unique uh, X such that the inner product of y and x is equal to x prime of y for any y in x. And the norm of x is the same as the norm, the dual norm of x prime. Here you can simply take, of course, uh, x to be uh, the inverse image of uh, x prime. So take note that, uh, again, according to the risk representation theorem, we have the risk isomorphism A J, if you want to emphasize the space, we put a subscript. So this is defined from X into X prime. And it is given uh, as follows, according to the proof or to the statement. So J X of Y is equal to Y of X, inner product of Y and X. And for this, we consider the following annotation called a duality pairing. So we pair an element of the primal space and a dual space. So for uh, x in the primal space, x prime in the dual space, uh, the duality pairing between x prime and x, okay. Is uh, the value 
of x prime at x. So the duality pairing is nothing but the value of the uh, linear functional x prime at the vector x or at the point x. Sometimes uh, we write this in reverse order, but also the subscript will be reversed as well. So here, the order is important so that you know which point lies on which uh, function space or Hilbert space. So with this, uh, we have the following. So if J is the uh, isomorphism, then, or there is isomorphism, then this duality pairing is the same as uh, the inner product. Since uh, j of x comma y is just the function value. Okay. And uh, again, since j is a linear operator, we uh, ignore the uh, parentheses for the first argument. Okay. And in a similar way, uh, the inner product between y and j inverse x prime. So here uh, you just uh, replace x by j inverse x prime. So you will get on the right hand side or on the left hand side x inverse or I should say x prime uh, y. And then this is the duality pairing in x. So replacing y by x, you have this duality pairing. So this duality pairing mimics uh, your uh, inner product. Since uh, x prime is isometrically isomorphic to x, let's say you can, well, up to the least isomorphism, you can replace this by x and you have uh, the inner product itself. And uh, of course, a direct consequence of the Heris representation theorem is the following corollary. So if H or if X is a Hilbert space, then so is the dual space. And uh, for this, it is enough to, uh, of course, construct the inner product. So for any two elements of the dual space, uh, the map uh, given by, so, so I want to uh, produce an inner product, but, of course, uh, you can use the inverse of the risk map. Now this inverse is now in the vector space or the Hilbert space X. So you can take the inner product. So this, this is an inner product on X prime that induces the dual norm. The fact that it is an inner product follows from uh, the fact that X is an inner product and J inverse is uh, linear. Okay. Moreover, uh, it is linear and bijective. So 
you can uh, verify that uh, immediately. Well, the second claim, why does it induce uh, the dual norm? Of course, uh, you can uh, simply apply uh, the risk representation uh, theorem since uh -huh. since the norm of j inverse x prime in x j is an uh, isometric isomorphism so you have this j of j inverse x prime uh, in x prime and this is equal to the dual norm of x prime okay so this uh, indeed uh, this inner product uh, induces the dual norm on x prime so that's uh, the proof So in the risk representation theorem, we use the uh, inner product of the Hilbert space. And the inner product, as we know, uh, for a, a real Hilbert space is asymmetric. So we can uh, interchange the arguments. But uh, one can drop the, uh, 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 the symmetry assumption. And uh, this will be uh, the so-called lux milgram lemma. And this is uh, utilized frequently in the study of uh, linear elliptic uh, partial differential equations, uh, for instance. So for this statement, let us take a real Hilbert space X. And a bilinear form or a form on the product space into R with uh, the following uh, assumptions. So the first one is bilinear. Uh, by this, we mean uh, that AX plus alpha Y Z is equal to a uh, a x z plus uh, alpha a y z and a of uh, x plus or I should say x y plus alpha z a x y plus alpha uh, a x z. So this is true for any uh, triple x y z and x, and for any scalar alpha. So this is uh, similar to your uh, inner product. So a is linear in both arguments, or uh, we call it bilinear. A is bounded. In other words, there exists a constant, uh, let's say a C1, positive constant, such that uh, the absolute value of the bilinear form is less than or equal to C1 times the norm of X times the norm of Y. for all x and y in your Hilbert space. And uh, finally, we suppose that A is coercive.
that is, uh, there is there exists another constant, say c sub two, such that uh, a uh, a x sub x is greater than or equal to c sub two uh, times uh, the norm of x squared for all x in uh, your uh, Hilbert space. So again, I suppose that A is a bilinear, bounded, and coercive form on the Hilbert space X. And if you think of A as your inner product, then uh, bilinearity is clear. Boundedness follows from uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality. And in fact, you can take C1 to be uh, equal to one. And likewise, coercivity is attained. Uh, equality is attained in coercivity simply by taking C2 to be one as well. So the inner product uh, satisfies this uh, property. Now, given an element F in the dual space, there exists a unique X in the primal space such that the variational a problem by this we mean uh, a x of y equal to the duality pairing uh, x prime x for all y in x has a unique solution Uh, moreover, one can estimate the norm of the solution by the norm of the given uh, data F. And it is the reciprocal of uh, the coercivity uh, constant uh, times the norm of F. Again, so uh, if uh, A uh, satisfies these three properties, then this variational equation uh, can be uh, solved uniquely in the real Hilbert space X. Uh, so for the proof, the main idea is to write our variational problem as an equation in uh, your vector space or in your Hilbert space X. So for this, let us define a map A from X into its uh, dual space, X prime, as follows. So A of X, this is an element of uh, the dual space. So we take the duality pairing This is just the value of the uh, bilinear form at X and Y. So let us first, uh, similar to the Ries representation theorem, uh, let us uh, show that A is uh, well-defined. And uh, from this, I take note that So that is A of X is in 
x prime. Okay, so ax is linear since a is linear with respect to the second argument. We know that A is bilinear, therefore it is linear uh, in the second argument. So that's a linearity. Uh, for boundedness, uh, you can uh, estimate, let's say, the duality pairing. We know that A is bounded, so this is C1 times the norm of X times the norm of Y. Okay. Thus, uh, AX uh, is bounded and in fact, the dual norm is less than or equal to, okay? So here, you can think of Y as your argument and the remaining uh, terms would be your upper bound. Okay. And that would be uh, the case. It follows also that uh, A uh, is linear, so is a linear operator from x to x prime. Uh, the linearity of A follows from uh, the fact that uh, A is linear uh, with respect to the first argument. And according to this, we can estimate its norm by C sub one. So that's uh, our operator A induced from uh, the bilinear operator small a. So combining the two equations, this means that uh, star, is equivalent to, okay, so we now replace uh, the bilinear form by the operator A. So this is true for any uh, Y in X. And Take note that two functions are equal if and only if uh, the values are equal for all y in the domain. So this is equivalent to ax equals f. But now this e equation is taken in the dual space. Okay, so just to have a diagram. So our map A is from X to X prime. I want to what? Uh, to solve, uh, let's say, to solve this in X instead of, in, of uh, X prime. So this is equivalent to uh, J inverse of A of X equal to J inverse of F. Here J, 
uh, is the risk map. So the risk map uh, is a mapping from x to x prime. Therefore, the inverse is a map from the dual space to the primal space. So the composition is a map from uh, x into itself. OK. So here we have written uh, the variational equation as an equation in uh, x. So to prove that this has a unique solution, we only need to show that A uh, is invertible. Since uh, this will imply that since J inverse is invertible, uh, the composition J inverse of A is invertible. Therefore, uh, given an F in uh, the dual space, you take the inverse, you evaluate that uh, with respect to the inverse of the risk isomorphism, it is now an element of X. If this is uh, invertible, uh, then you can find an element X uh, such that uh, this equation is uh, valid. And since these are equivalent, this is equivalent to the solvability of the uh, variational problem. So let us show that uh, indeed A is invertible. So uh, let's say A is injective. How do we establish injectivity of uh, J, or, or I should say A? So for this, let us uh, apply uh, coercivity with respect uh, to this one. So applying coercivity Uh, so suppose uh, ax first is equal to zero. Then, if I take this duality pairing, by definition, this is just the uh, bilinear form evaluated at x and x. But this, this is greater than a c sub 2 times the norm of x is great. Since uh, ax is zero, this is zero. So the norm of uh, x squared is equal to zero, hence x must be zero. Okay, take note that C2 is positive, so you can divide by C2 as well. And since the norm is non-negative, you end up with uh, the fact that x must be zero. So uh, that is injectivity of uh, A. A is a surjective. Uh, to prove this, uh, let us, uh, let's say, uh, let us show that uh, J inverse of A uh, is surjective. Take note that uh, since J is surjective, then uh, the composition of two surjective maps is again a surjective. So this implies that uh, A, which is basically J, J inverse of A is surjective. Okay. So we 
show the surjectivity of J inverse of A. So first, uh, we establish uh, the surjectivity in two parts. The range of J inverse of A is closed. in uh, X. Okay, so let, uh, let us consider, uh, say, uh, a sequence, so let YN be a sequence in the range such that uh, YN tends to Y for some X in capital X. So to prove uh, the closeness of uh, the range, we need to show that Y is also in the range. So for each N, uh, there exists uh, according to the definition of the range, there exists an xn in x such that uh, yn is equal to j inverse of a x sub n. And if we uh, apply uh, the coercivity, so that's c2 times uh, xn, minus xm, this is uh, equal to uh -huh. So let us apply uh, the fact that this is uh, A of xn less than or equal to AXN, AXN, X prime. Okay, this is somewhat quick, so let us do this step-by-step -step process. So this is uh, xn minus xm. Since, uh, take note that this is the same. As a of xn minus xm with respect to the duality, uh, with respect to the bilinear form. Okay, so this is less than or equal to axn minus AXM, the dual norm, times the norm of the difference. So if the difference is not equal to zero, you can cancel that factor. However, if uh, what, uh, that this norm is equal to zero, then uh, this obviously holds. So overall, this inequality is valid. Okay, now we apply the fact that J inverse is an isometry. So this is AXM. By definition, this is what, uh, YN minus YM, according to this part of X. And take note that this converges to zero as N and M goes to infinity. Since YN is convergent, uh, therefore it is Cauchy, hence we have this convergence. So the sequence of inverse images is Cauchy. 
So for some x, this sequence will converge to this x. And by a continuity, of uh, j inverse of a. Uh, take note that uh, bounded linear operators are continuous and the composition of two continuous functions is again continuous. So by continuity, we can evaluate or we can plug in the limit of j, this is j inverse uh, x, okay? Since uh, this is take note, yn and yn tends to y in x, hence by uniqueness of limits, uh, y must be the same as j inverse a of x. So y is also in the range of j inverse of a. So the range is closed. The next uh, step is to show that uh, this range is dense in X. By way of uh, contradiction, suppose that it is not dense in X. And we will see uh, if, uh, and we will see later uh, a false statement. Okay, so if this is not uh, dense, then there must be an element, a non zero element, such that the inner product of Y and Z. Uh, is equal to zero for any uh, z in the range of j in verse a. So this means that, uh, or sure, I should say for all y. This means that uh, the orthogonal complement is not equal to uh, zero. Well, if uh, the, your set is dense, then the closure must be X and the orthogonal would be a zero, which is not possible. Okay, now, taking a note that by mimicking this uh, computation here, C sub two times uh, the norm of Z, X squared. So this is according to coercivity, less than or equal to the bilinear form evaluated as Z in both arguments. However, this is also uh, A of Z, Z with duality pairing. And recall that okay, I can make this into an inner product however I need to replace the linear functional by the J inverse this is obviously an element of the range of J inverse A. According to this, equality here, this must be zero. So you can take Y to be J inverse of A of Z. Then 
this implies that z is zero. A contradiction. So this assumption here is not valid. Hence, uh, the range of J inverse of A is dense in X. And the two, that is the density and the closeness implies surjectivity of J inverse of A. Indeed, since J inverse, the range of J inverse is closed, So the set must be the same as the closure. Okay. However, if your set is dense, so the closure must be X. So this is now density. So the, the range of J inverse of A is uh, surjective or the range of J inverse of A is the whole of X. Therefore, going back to this, J inverse of A is a surjective. And this implies uh, that A is surjective according to this uh, discussion. Therefore, uh, again, A is surjective and A is injective. And that uh, proves the uh, surjectivity of A or the invertibility of A and therefore the invertibility of J inverse A. And according to this part here, we have the unique solvability of this equation. And hence, according to this equivalence, the unique solvability of the uh, variational equation. Okay, now uh, for the estimate, you can follow uh, the same. Uh, estimate and uh, you can prove this uh, part. So let us prove this for completeness. Uh, note that C2 norm of X uh, is less than or equal to uh, A of X and X prime for any X in capital X. Well, we just need to recycle the proof uh, last time. So let me go back here. You just apply this. Uh, you just replace uh, XN by X and uh, replace XN by zero. So therefore, uh, you have uh, this one. And dividing by uh, dividing by x, the norm of x, okay, this is true for any x not equal to zero. And if we take the soup, this implies that uh, the operator norm of uh, A uh -huh. I want the inverse of A. So let us rewrite this as C2 times A inverse, let's say, of uh, So let us remove this.
and this is what uh, our uh, equivalent equation so going back uh, this one so we take a particular x that's the solution okay so we take the uh, a inverse uh -huh. i think uh, this is better A inverse of f, norm of x times. Uh, so if I take ax equals f, so f is in x prime, so ax. So divide by. the norm of f in x prime and divide by a c sub 2 and you have this and this is true for any uh, uh, f that is in x prime not equal to zero therefore the operator norm the inverse so this is what uh, from x prime to x is less than one over c two. Okay. So we also have the estimate of the inverse of uh, your uh, operator a. And uh, from from here, in particular. Uh, if I recycle this estimate here, and the fact that ax equals f, this implies that the norm of a inverse f, well, that's basically x, is less than or equal to 1 over c2 times uh, the norm of uh, f in x prime. So you have uh, the stability of your solution. So in other words, if you uh, slightly uh, change the uh, data f, then you, uh, you obtain uh, a small change in the solution. That's uh, the end of the proof of Dilak's uh, Milgram lemma. So it's a, a general uh, version of your this representation theorem where you can uh, relax the symmetry by a non-symmetry. Of course, uh, the this representation theorem was uh, proved uh, as a first step because we needed it uh, in the proof of this uh, theorem or of this uh, lax milgram lemma so in the next uh, lecture ne uh, next series of lectures let us apply this to uh, a specific uh, type of uh, an elliptic uh, pd for instance uh, modeling uh, let's say a stationary heat source uh, just to give you uh, an idea on the application of this abstract result to more concrete uh, problems and in the next lecture we will also discuss uh, modifications and generalizations of the lax milgram lemma that is applicable to certain type of uh, problems uh, that's it for now and see you on the next one